morning, and Marianne reminded us that a few days ago, Afghan women voices were banned from the public space. I cannot find any better example of the reverse of freedom of expression and human rights. They are not the only ones whose voices are suppressed and silenced. And human rights organizations are not always on, on our side. You could probably remember you may remember in Nadia's film that one human rights organization in Tunisia was asking for her being her film being banned and she be taken to court. My in my case, I'm from Algeria and the eye opener for me was the nineties, the decade of the nineties where we had what has been called the world over a civil war, but we called it a war against civilians because we were crushed in between an undemocratic government and armed Islamic groups whose will was to Islamize a country which was already 100% Muslim. Therefore, it means they really wanted the Taliban version of Islam to rule Algeria. It's interesting that the GIA, the, the Islamic armed groups, was a sort of I don't find the English word, sorry. It's something which we later see, have seen developed as Daesh, the Islamic group. You know. The GIA people, fighters, were, it's important to say, trained in Peshawar, Pakistan, with Iranian instructors, military instructors, so we can see how already they were working in a coalition which was an international, probably not only, unfortunately, the only international of today. For 10 years, there were hundreds of thousands of victims. But interestingly, the majority of them were women Women were forbidden, for instance, to be hairdressers or to work in beauty parlors. This was really targeting women in a very specific way. It's also the first time we have heard of slavery camps where girls and women were taken as domestic and sexual slaves. And you later heard that in Daesh camps, of course. We had no support, and I insist on no support, from human rights organizations, from the major international human rights organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, Lawyers Collective. Briefly, we had support from Center for Constitutional Rights because we had a friend, a lawyer, who was working at the headquarters and it was a very brief support. So it's not only that they didn't defend our human rights, which were violated, but they told us, I banged at their door for 10 years to no avail. So I was told repeatedly, but you are not victims of a state, you are victims of non-state actors, and therefore we consider only states are responsible for the human rights of the citizens. Not only were they not supporting us, but they were supporting the Muslim fundamentalists, including the armed group's leaders. For instance, they helped them get asylum in the whole of Europe, where we could not have asylum. 
they helped them by organizing tours in which they could present their opinion and their views of what was going on in Algeria, speaking tours. They were really helped in so many ways with lawyers when they were taken to court, etc. At that time, I thought that human rights organizations were really our worst enemies. Many years later, I realized that the same thing happened in Afghanistan. Elder Afghan women told me that during the Soviet occupation, all major human rights organizations supported the religious opposition and did not support the women at all. No people in general were opposed to Muslim fundamentalism. And there's also the example of a friend of us who should be in the room today, was the whole day, certainly, who has been fired from Amnesty International for denouncing publicly the fact that they gave political support to a very well-known activist of Muslim fundamentalism whose name was Moazam Beg. I hope that maybe she will speak from the floor and tell us more about this episode. I personally felt the need to understand a little bit why such a nonsense could happen that human rights organizations, which should have been on our side and fully on our side, were on the side of armed fundamentalists. So we have to go back a little bit into history to explain why. The concepts of human rights and of laicity were born out of the French Revolution in 1789. I insist on the f I want to draw your attention to the fact that the, the word laicité, which is the French word, was used in the title of this panel. Because it's very different from secularism. And it's one explanation, the, probably the major explanation for the attitude of human rights organizations. Taslim and Asrim, 20, 30 years ago, started using laicity as if it were an English word to raise awareness on the fact that secularism was pretty different. Laicity is the separation between state and religions. Article 1 of the law of 1905 which established laicity in France is states that the secular republic guarantees all citizens freedom of creed, freedom of religion, and freedom of practice. That's Article 1. So for me, it's very hard to understand how today people can say that it's against religions. Article 1 of the law, which is still in existence today. <laughs> Article 2 states that the secular republic will not recognize religions, will not dialogue with their representatives, will not fund them, will not have any interaction with them. But citizens are perfectly entitled to having a religion and to practice it. And the secular republic guarantees this right. Secularism is a very different story. Secular, secularism is defined as equal treatment by the state regarding all religion, religions. So it means that it stops being an individual right, the right of the citizen. And by the way, initially, this was called the rights of man and of the citizen. I won't comment on man, but I will comment on the citizen. Why has the citizen, the individual citizen, been disappeared? It's now only the, right, the human rights. Citizen is nowhere there. So that the rights 
the human rights are now in the hands of groups, whether religions, corporations, or you name it. But it has disappeared for the rights of the individual. This is a conceptual and political shift which has an enormous backlash on us today. It deprives the person from his human rights. We need to go back, absolutely, we need to go back to the original definition of secularism, of laicity, and reject the equal tolerance by the state to organize groups. This breeds communalism. This is what we see all over Europe now. Can and we, we, so I'm really sorry, just for could we continue this? Just the one. Okay, okay, that's fine. We cannot allow human rights organizations to support extreme right political organizations in the name of human rights. <coughs> Muslim fundamentalists are not, definitely not, a religious movement. They're extremely ignorant about religion. They are an extreme right political force. And if you look at their statements, you will see that they are no different from Nazis and fascists. They believe they are the superior creed, not the superior race, but the superior creed. And in the name of that, they feel they, they, feel they have a right and duty to exterminate, to physically exterminate those who don't believe. Thank you. And as far as women are concerned, they could actually replicate the fascist formula that women should be confined to church, replaced by mosque, kitchen, and cradle. This is what fundamentalists want us to be. Thank you so much. Can I uh, uh, call upon the other panelists as well? Mariam Aliou as well. Thank you very much. Uh, she's a women's rights activist, founder of Learning Through Skills, Acquisition and Initiative. She works to provide protection for survivors of gender-based violence, access to justice, justice, as well as creating a safe space in northern Nigeria, fighting Boko Haram. Can I have also Stephen Evans, the chief executive of the National Secular Society and a regular media commentator. The Nada um, Peratovic, a solicitor and human activist, uh, human rights activist as well. Hi, Thank you. 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 Yep, there we go. Uh, Co-founder and co-president of the Freedom From Religion uh, Foundation, author of several books including Woe to Women, The Bible Tells Me. Is that everyone? Awesome. Thank you very much. No, no, it's okay. Okay, thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you. Yeah, it's fine. I'd like to open up. Um, we've got quite a, a diverse panel here, ranging from Eastern Europe, America, Africa, UK as well. Um, so we've got quite a range of, I suppose, experiences of secularism, like it as well. Can I start with actually Mariam, please? Um, from, from Nigeria, so this is too many. It's quite a lot of Mariam to this event, I realize. Well, my sister's name is Mariam as well. It makes it better. Yeah, so um, why is there a fatwa in your head? No, no pressure. I think that's quite a common thing in this room, by the way. So you're a good company. Okay, uh, once again, thank you so much for uh, giving me a platform to also end my voice. Thank you so much, Mariam Namazia. You are an amazing role model. <laughs> and uh, also thank you so much, Zara, for the connection. I love you so much. <laughs> uh, well, uh, straight to the point, um, I have a fatra because I'm disobedient. I guess that's what they say. Uh, I have been referred to I'm, I'm from the northern part of Nigeria, and I speak the Hausa language. And uh, I have always been a very vocal voice, and um, most people who know me uh, think that uh, I had no proper upbringing, because it is really difficult for you to find a young woman. I, I started speaking when I was, what, 19? 
um, it's been extremely challenging for me as well because a lot of people didn't understand where I was coming from. But, um, well, I guess I have a fatwa because of the fact that I am speaking about what, what I feel should be a normal norm where I'm from. I'm talking about the rights of women and girls. I'm talking about the fact that a young girl um, at the age of 13 shouldn't be married to a man old enough to be her ancestor. She should be in school. She yes. should be, you know, she should come out to become somebody in the This is what I'm talking about. So, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong in this. And I also remember that um, as a 2020 became worse for me because I took up the case of uh, Mubarak Bala, whom most people here know about. And um, I think also Mubarak's case kind of gave me a voice to be able to also come out and, and say a whole lot of other things. And before I knew it, my pictures were marked and then it was already viral. And I was getting invited uh, for questioning at the, the, the station, which Zara has been of tremendous help to me as well. And also Center for Inquiry and so many other people. Um, yeah, you can yeah, you should. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah so um, it's, it's been a really challenging period for me uh, as well because uh, I mean, normally in Nigeria, when people come to arrest you, they come with their uniforms, but these people didn't come with their uniform. They came with a mufti. And then uh, I, was, I was now asking questions at the police station like, okay, do, do the police now have a session that talks, you know, that persecute people because they are talking about religion or they are doing something regarding that? And also the fact that I took a case, I'm a human rights defender, I defend every case, irrespective of religion, because at that time I was still a bit closeted, I was knocked out mm -hmm. fully. And I was like, the case of Mubarak is also a case that I want to take up and I want to, what is wrong about that? I have a right in Nigeria to do that. According to section 32 of the, um, 36 of the Nigerian constitution, I have a right to talk about freedom of religion. And I have a right to talk about cases like that. I have done a lot of cases in Nigeria that has also you know, put, me into, put, put me into a lot of trouble, especially cases where uh, projects where we are trying, we work with UNICEF, I work with UNICEF, UN Women and so many other organizations. But sometimes I'm censored, which also, you know, I relate to what you just said in your remark as well. Because um, so during this, my activism and, and my work, I, I you know, we, we, we do, um, I don't know how to, to, to place it. It's more as if we are trying to go through the parents of these children who have been married off to, to men, you, you know, in the, the community. We are trying to use their parents, yeah. encourage their parents to kind of pull out the children. We don't go directly to the kids. We go through the parents. We convince the mother. We take the mother to several facilities of young girls who are now uh, having what they call the vestic vagina fistula, which is an abnormal connection between um, uh, visceral organs. Uh, it's a medical, you know, disease that ruins the life completely of a young girl. You know, um, so we try to see how we can encourage their mothers to come. Okay, look at young girls who are married off young. Take an example of what has happened to their life. Do, would you like your daughter to end up this way? Yeah. You know, something like that. So we try to use some sort of, uh, we call it uh, reverse psychology on them. And then we also, I go with Muslim women and so many other people. And the difference between my work is that I don't just work with only ex-Muslims or humanists. I work with survivors all survivors, survivors of gendered violence, survivors of uh, persecution, and also um, persons with disability who have really um, little to no support from, even from some rights organizations where I am from. Yeah. So basically, I'm, I'm going to stop here. And Perfect then timing. maybe I'll say more later. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Stephen, um, What's happening in your neck of the woods in the UK? There's been a lot of uh, ups and downs in the UK. I think a lot of um, soul searching. I don't know if that's what you want to say. We're sort of trying to find our national sort of, um, you could say, home or language. A lot of the problems that are happening in you would say the Middle East or North Africa and, and Africa in general, uh, maybe not as bad in the UK, but there are certain tremors that are being felt in the UK as well. Yeah, we certainly have our problems um, when it comes to religion and uh, religious privilege and religious fundamentalism. Um, we're not a secular state. Just, just to quickly on the, uh, the question of terminology, when I talk about secularism, my conception of secularism is very close to laicite. Um, I think what, when you talk about your version of what you think secularism is, to me that's more sort of multi-faithism, this idea that all religions have equal treatment. Um, you know, a leveling. It, so, in our country, for example, that would be a kind of leveling up. So, Christianity at the moment, the Christian Church has um, significant privileges in the UK. So, the model of kind of multi-faithism would suggest that other religions 
need to have similar privileges. Uh, I'm all for levelling down and, and stripping all religions of their privileges. So just probably important to point out, when I talk about secularism, I'm more talking about uh, something much closer to lazy tape. Um, of course, we don't have a secular state in the UK. Uh, not yet. That's something we're still working on. Um, but we do have a largely secular society, and that's come off the back of many years, decades of dissent from um, secularists uh, who, you know, the situation in the UK, from, we were formed as an organization about 150 years ago. Um, since then, we've seen greater freedom of religion or belief. We've seen greater uh, sexual freedom. People uh, have the right to marry whoever they wish, same-sex marriages. Uh, we have gender, greater gender equality. We have reproductive freedoms. All these things have been rolled out. Uh, religious education has largely been replaced by secular education, although we're not quite there yet. We still have faith schools, but you know, huge progress has been made because Britain has become a much more secular country. And so it's really good that we celebrate dissenters that have brought that about. So our founder, Charles Bradlaw, Annie Besson, both prosecuted, uh, accused of blasphemy and prosecuted. Uh, a predecessor of mine at the National Secular Society, uh, former president of ours, G.W. Foote, he spent a year in prison for blasphemy. So, you know, these are the people who've come before us and made it possible to have the freedoms that we enjoy in the UK. Uh, but just going on to freedom of expression, uh, we don't have blasphemy laws in the UK. Uh, ours were scrapped. Um, but one thing to note about our blasphemy laws actually is because Traditionally, we come from a, um, uh, it's a Christian church that has all the political power and the influence. Our blasphemy laws only covered Christianity, only protected Christianity. And that came as a real um, shock and disappointment to reactionary Muslims in the 80s when uh, the Satanic Verses was published by Salman Rushdie. And reactionary Muslims wanted to use blasphemy laws to to prosecute Salman Rushdie, but they couldn't. Um, and I think that was part of the reason why it was possible to get rid of our blasphemy laws, because it was recognized that in a, in a country that values equality and pluralism, to have a set of blasphemy laws that so clearly um, bias one particular religion, that just wasn't going to wash. So we managed to get rid of our blasphemy laws, but we, like is so often the case, yeah. there was a kind of quick pro quo, and uh, racial and religious hatred uh, laws came in instead, um, and as originally drafted, they would have criminalised, they would have um, outlawed expressions of uh, dislike, antipathy, uh, ridicule, insult, uh, offensive words about religion. So it's the work of the National Secular Society and, and many others who uh, joined us on that cause to make sure that even with a, uh, a, a religious, and, uh, religious and Racial Hatred Act, the possibility to uh, disrespect religion and to robustly criticize it was protected. So we want some really important free speech protections, but we really need to be mindful of hate crime legislation, bringing in backdoor blasphemy laws. Yeah. Uh, the biggest problem we ha probably have at the moment is um, the concept, it's been raised many times today, this concept of Islamophobia, which as we all know conflates um, hatred against Muslims and sometimes abuse against Muslims with criticism of religion. Yep. And we've just actually funded a, a, a big piece of research that looks at the experience of ex-Muslims in the UK and something that's coming out of that is that this concept of Islamophobia <laughs> really makes it very difficult for ex-Muslims to talk about their experience within the religion and to express their disdain for the religion <laughs> that's caused them so much trauma and grief. Um, so yeah, we really need to push back against not just Islamophobia, because now we've got Hindu phobia, Sikha phobia, it's opening the door to all these sort of religion-based phobias, so we need to be very mindful of that. And the final thing I would say is just that we need to be, uh, one thing that's a problem in terms of freedom of expression in the UK is fear. Um, if you look at the, uh, the actions of the uh, Islamists to attack Charlie Hebdo, uh, we had a similar event, uh, well, not really a similar event, but we had another event in the UK at a high school where a teacher used a, a picture of Prophet Muhammad to teach a lesson about citizenship and about freedom of expression. So we used this as an educational resource, a picture of Muhammad, just to show what the debate was about. Um, that teacher uh, received death threats, he um, lost his job, 
He fled in fear of his life, and you know his whole life and career has been ruined. So incidents like that yeah. really um, teach people to shut up, and so they generate a real fear, they lead to self-censorship, and I think we just need to be honest that part of the problem around freedom of expression is fear, and um, it's easy to say, you know, we shouldn't be cowed by terrorists, it's easier said than it is done. So that's some of the things going on in the UK. Thank you so much, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, Nada, um, um, from Cro Croatia. Croatia, thanks so much. Um, Tell me about what's happening in Croatia. It's not something, and maybe, maybe many people are not familiar with that region, but also how you mentioned like neocons have sort of infiltrated, and maybe there's some influence from America as well. So that'd be interesting to see what's happening in that region. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, to Mariam and to everybody the, for this great conference. And I'm always so touched with all the experience of the ex-Muslims, I want to tell you that I hope one day I can uh, tell you also the story of the Muslims from Balkan, especially the women, who in, in during the Second World War, most of them, uh, they put off their hijab and they went to the partisans to fight against the fascists and the na 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 Nazis. So this but suddenly their grand granddaughters now put the put the hijab again on so uh, i want to to tell you two stories first of all i will answer your question it's about uh, the network of neoconservatives in croatia who are all uh, intervened with, with, with the Polish, with the, with the Americans, with the Russians, and this is what I have to read because I... And that after that I, will, I would like to say a few words about my organization, about my women's uh, network for uh, support for abortion, brave sisters. But this is in the second part, is it? it's okay. Okay, I want only to... I wanted only to remind you of some statistics, of some facts, uh, uh, and I will read it to, to be fast, not to, to, to. So, according to a report of the European Parliamentary Forum for Sexual and Reproductive Rights from 2021, the majority of funders of European anti-feminist organizations are Russian oligarchs and the Christian right from the United States of America. And now here, their money they have, we can, I think, only dream of them. So the report identifies 707,2 million US dollars in anti-feminist funding over the year of 2009 till 2018 period, originating from the United States and the Russian Federation in Europe. It's very, I mean, it's very interesting how the comrades <laughs> uh, uh, find uh, that they have a similar ground to, to fight against women's <coughs> rights. Uh, based on the available financial reports for 55 organizations in the period from 2009 to 2000 till 2018, it is evident that uh, 81 million US dollars were donated from the US 188 million from the Russian Federation and 473 million from the EU. At the same time, the funds invested from the EU have almost tripled in just one decade. Uh, I wanted only to be how to be short, not not, but I have to mention some of the of these organizations. There is this organization, Tradition, Family and Property. They are from Poland. Uh, they were founded in South America. I will not tell all the story now from them. You can you can Google them for, for themselves. But they are all. This Catholic as association has about 110 million dollars uh, get for in the, in these in these uh, nine years. 
but it is <laughs> interesting that uh, this is a, uh, also fr from Poland. Uh, but in 2019, there was a new conflict, this time between Polish fundamentalists and this tradition family and private property organization. And the reason was identical real estate and millions of euros. So uh, <laughs> it's not about ideology, it's about money. Then we have also the Agenda Eurogroup. They call themselves since 2080 Vision Network Group. It's a lobby network composed of several hundred of the most powerful ultra-conservative organizations and political movements. They have the, probably, uh, Gaylor knows, uh, the CFAM. Do you know them? Or the Family Watch and in International, or the ADF International, yes, yes. Also the World World Congress of Families, an umbrella organization which is connected to Konstantin Malofiev, an ultra-orthodox oligarch, Putin's propagandist. His associate, Alexei Komov, led the R Russian branch of the World Congress of Families and was, one, was on the board of Citizen Go. So they are all connected and they are all preparing and making uh, war against us and how they start, this is also interesting. There is also, last time uh, when we were in, in, in Paris, we, uh, Nina Sankari from Poland asked you, do you know who, what is Ordo, Ordo Juris? They are an uh, ultra conservative Catholic legal or organization and think tank. And they are, for example, uh, they pushed the ban of, 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 of abortion in Poland. And these lobbying methods were shaped before in the level of United Nations with the help of the Russian Federation and also Afri African countries. They managed to push uh, a series of resolutions in the UN protecting the family. But that's protecting but harmful for millions of women. And there are so many here names I want. I don't want uh, uh, yep. to, to. Yes, to. Maybe to, we can get into that. As yes, 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 please, please yes. Finish off, please. Yes, okay, this is. Sorry, so I'm really. No, 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 no. I feel really bad. Yeah. No, 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 please, please. Last thoughts, last thoughts. Yeah. Uh, no, no, yeah. this, this I will explain when I see. Okay, okay. When you see fine. the picture for the second part. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Appreciate that. Um, also. <laughs> Um, Annie uh, from the US, never a dull day in the US. <laughs> You're always causing problems for the rest of us. Sorry, yeah. so, so sorry. It's it's okay, okay. Spending freedom, <laughs> causing a great deal of problems for us. But to, to cause them in Croatia and Africa and the EU, that's just too much. <laughs> yeah, so uh, this is the part where she apologizes, Andre. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a, obviously a lot of um, noise happening in the US around the role of religion as always. Um, I think it's kind of set up near every election is always brought up to, to the, in, in, in every political um, discourse as well. So what would you say right now is a major threat in the US? We always see the US as the beacon, the standard free speech, but it's always, you can never rest because people are always looking to protect their own um, ideology. So what would you say is the major threat? Well, the major threat would be Christian nationalism and their puppet, Donald Trump. <laughs> And you all know there's an election coming up. Yeah. And that's really what I was going to talk about. Yeah, yeah. So I did want to say, in terms of uh, laicite, and that it, we call that the separation between government and religion in the United States, as we understand it, is not just a cornerstone of free expression and rights. That's the title of this workshop. But it's a cornerstone of democracy. Um, because a, a pure democracy um, without protection for freedom of conscience is really mob rule. And in the United States, we find that protection in the Bill of Rights. Um, there's always got to be some protection, whether it's Article 1 of the French Constitution, Article 2. Um, but here in the United States, um, where we have our godless and secular constitution, the current threat is actually not mob rule, it's actually minority rule. And that danger is coming from an attempt to take over our country by Christian nationalists, and white Christian nationalists, I should amend, who want to impose their dogma and, and their particular extremist, fundamentalist or Catholic uh, version of Christianity on, on the rest of us while privileging 
themselves, and they really are the enemies of, of our Constitution. Since it was adopted, uh, the Christian clergy, there have been many in the Christian clergy who have been hostile to that Constitution because it is secular. And they see Trump as their savior, or really, in biblical terms, he's a latter-day King Cyrus, who was the Persian king who was pagan, but he set the Jews free from Babylon, and that's how they see him and themselves. So the Christian evangel evangelicals, um, supposedly they were the moral majority, but they have long ceded or abandoned their moral high ground uh, that they formerly claimed. They don't care that Trump has been convicted in civil court of sexual assault. They don't care about his vulgarity. They don't care that he's a convicted felon 30 times over. None of this matters to them because he's their ticket to theocracy. And he is going to deliver them from a godless America to a, a, a Christian theocracy, just as he delivered them on abortion, where uh, he promised he would appoint people to the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade, and that is exactly what he did. And uh, I usually do give a rundown on abortion rights. If you're interested where it is in the United States, I can quickly do that. Um, a third of US women today live in a state where it is not legal to get an abortion. However, last year there were more abortions than ever before. Uh, there are a lot of abortion funds, but also women are able to obtain medication abortion pills, even if it's illegal. And this has infuriated the Christian anti-abortion movement, which intends to abolish abortion completely. So it wants to bring back an archaic federal law known as the Comstock Act. Have you been reading about this at all? Um, it dates to 1873. It's a, an act of Congress that was enacted at the behest of a Protestant fundamentalist zealot named Anthony Comstock. This is 1873. It really, for more than 50 years, the Comstock Act was, was good law. It's about obscenity, but it included bans on shipping obscene articles. And that means contraception and abortifacients. And Margaret Sanger kind of did him in in 1936, and there were other Supreme Court decisions on the right to contraception in the 1960s. And Roe versus Wade overturned the abortifacient part. Now that Roe versus Wade has been overturned, they're saying it's good law. And two justices of the Supreme Court, as Gita earlier pointed out, say it is good law. And we also have Project 2025, which I'm sure you've been hearing about, which is a 900-page playbook or strategy to overtake our country with an autocracy. And it also calls for ab abolishing abortion. And so. I just want to conclude that uh, we have great hope at the moment that we can restore some basic democratic principles in November. Dan and I live in the swing state. There are seven swing states that are going to determine the outcome of the election, but it is so close. It is frightening that it is this close. It's almost impossible to understand. The only way you can understand it is that of, is religion. Our, the America uh, I grew up in was deferential to religion. Um, it never wanted to criticize religion, to criticize the clergy. And this is what results from that. And so I want to tell you that you are all doing the right thing when you speak out against religion, when you speak up for keeping religion out of our laws and our secular policies. Um, it is essential um, that we uh, ensure that religion does not prevail, and it is a truth that we say at the Freedom from Religion Foundation, it's our motto, that freedom depends on free thinkers. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Um, I'm going to ask some questions uh, based on what you've said here, so we're going to see, see what happens here. And, and I, I know we've spoken about a lot of the challenges that all the regions face. But is there any news of positivity? Just like maybe think one, one, one like positive thing you've seen, one positive change you've seen in your many years of activism or things you've observed. Because I think it's also important to note the things that are going in our favor. So you mentioned all the things that maybe are not, 
but we want to give some people hope and say that actually what we're doing is actually making a real difference. So, so yeah, or, yeah, you can go first. Or, yeah, please, please. No, I think we... Oh, sorry, yeah. Mike. Sorry. Sorry, Mike. My bad. I think we are losing ground all over. I think secularism as laicity, as separation, is disappearing, including in France, under the pressure of European institutions, amongst other things. And I would like to point one of the consequences it has, for instance, in the UK. The fact that the state recognizes religion and dialogue with them has led to different categories of citizens being ruled by different laws. Is this democracy? The religious laws, UK has a few hundred of what they call Sharia courts, religious courts for Muslims. These laws, supposedly religious laws, have not been voted. This is totally undemocratic. And they are not only not voted, but decreed by reactionary men who pretend they represent God. I think it, there is a real problem. Yeah, OK, thank you. Yeah. Um, any any points to this, sir? Anything? Uh, Anything. Okay, uh, for instance, well, I think uh, <laughs> I would just say that um, no, there is no problem. But I feel. I'm not giving up, maybe the next one. Yeah. Well, okay, I feel for. I think we are still struggling with people even knowing that they have rights in Nigeria, mm. especially in northern Nigeria. For us women, children still feel like, um, you know, their life and everything depends on whatever it is that they manage. Or, or the mufti, or the sheikh, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, said. I, I remember as, at the time when I started asking questions. I, I asked about why is it that women are always the ones that are you know suffering from literally everything. We are to be blamed for everything. It's like literally the problem that Khadija had with Muhammad is taken out on all of us because I don't <laughs> see any reason why someone would, would go into into a cave, out of and stay in a cave for two, three days. Of course, you're going to hallucinate and you're going to start saying things, and then boom, <laughs> the Quran and boom. <laughs> The first response I got was Kulu Nafsin, sir, he cut a mouth. And I was like, what does that have to do with me? Like Kulu Nafsin is like every soul must taste death. Uh, mm. And then I asked, what does that have to do with me? You know, I remember that few few months back, few few months ago rather, um, a lady I know personally, Hadid, um, her name is Khadija, and then she, she called me on the phone and she was like, Mariam, I've been seeing your post on Facebook and I've been hearing a lot of things you've been saying because we have a safe space in northern parts of Nigeria where women just, you know, come together. It's more about safe space for survivors of rape and gender violence, but there are also women there who are free to reach, remove the hijab and just have normal conversations. And uh, I also set up this uh, group for ex-Muslims in Nigeria where people now come together, we, we come so together. Positive. Yeah. Well, it is positive okay. because they are still close. They are close. Okay. All, most of them are close, and I remember some of them also need psychosocial support, which I am. Um, I discussed uh, some with Sarah about. So. Um, for me, I feel it's positive that they are coming out of their shell. It's a really, really gradual process. Probably I might not be alive <laughs> the time you know most of these things uh, is going to take a, a new fold. Yeah. But it is positive and okay. it, it is slow, but it's steady. And I think a lot of awareness needs to go in Africa. They, yeah. We have problems there. You know, uh, uh, some people don't even know they are not aware of it. So it's just some of us, very few of us, people like, you know, Mubarak and, you know, myself and so many other people are it, coming out and they are saying one or two things about it. But I know the death threats. And I know I can't go to Nigeria for now. Uh, and maybe in the next few years, I hope it's still possible for me to go out because that's where my life is, my everything is there. Absolutely. You know, so, um, yeah, more awareness. And not just from us that are from there, but also from the international community and every other person as well here. Please also call out our parliamentarians because currently Nigeria is being ruled by Muslim Muslim. You know, that is the Muslim, is the, the president is a Muslim, the vice president is also a Muslim. And what this means is that the whole of Nigeria now is owned by Muslims. Right. So in, everywhere you go now, there are statistics that are coming out and I'm like, oh, 90% of Nigeria are, Mus uh, are Muslims, and then 10% or 80% of Nigerians. And I'm like, where is 80% of Nigerians Muslims? When did that happen? You know, because I still remember, you know, far back before Muslim, Muslim, Muslim government took over. 
We have at least 60% of Nigerians who are Christian, who are um, Christian, or 50% of Nigerians who are Christians, and then 10% of traditional religions, mm -hmm. and then others are, you know, people who are just um, the blasphemous uh, outcasts and yeah. who, who might belong to us. Well. So. You know, this is existing there in Nigeria, but then it's that still we have everything now has been completely shielded. Okay. And I apologize for hugging the mic for two It's long. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so then, yeah. I'm going to come back to positive. Uh, Stephen, help me out here. Um, I think these are tough times for liberals, but yeah. having said that, I think liberal values are facing so many threats um, from uh, the religious right, mm -hmm. whether it be the Christian right, so much funding coming into Europe um, and elsewhere in the world, uh, rising identity politics. You know, these are, these are tough times, but uh, I'm an optimist. I wouldn't really get out of bed uh, in the morning unless I had this optimism that keeps me going. And I've, I've certainly seen, I think a lot of what I gain um, some sort of satisfaction, satisfaction from sometimes is just not conceding ground, yeah. just holding the ground. So for example, when hate crime legislation comes through that's gonna bring back a blasphemy law, we opposed it, and we opposed it successfully, and we found allies uh, amongst you know all sectors of society, and in Parliament as well. And we 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 resisted, and we got that through. And about ten, well, fifteen, twenty years ago, now we started raising the plight of um, children in unregistered illegal schools in the UK. Nobody was talking about it. It was happening in in certain boroughs in England, and this is where. Basically, we've got a pretty relaxed approach to homeschooling, and some religious fundamentalists were home educating their children, supposedly. But what was actually happening is they're being sent to dangerous, dirty, unsafe, illegal religious schools where they're denied any secular education whatsoever and only taught religion. And uh, we started. Us and actually the Jewish Chronicle were quite good on this as well, then other organisations joined in. And over the years we've been making some noise about that, and Ofsted started getting very interested, the government started getting interested. So now, you know, we've seen progress on, on particular yep. policy issues. Um, we haven't seen enough progress, illegal schools are still operating, but some have been closed down. And there's a real effort now, there's a real kind of political push to make sure that children's rights in these educational, so-called educational settings are protected. Absolutely. So, you know, we, we, you know we, there are victories on the way, but, you know, I think the overall kind of feeling is that, mm. as I said, these are tough times for liberals. No, I agree. I agree. That's why it's important to hear these stories. Ben, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, uh, something positive is, uh, although we see the rising of the neoconservative movement in, in Croatia, they are good funded, they are enthusiastic, uh, they are uh, quite loud, but okay, they are still a minority. And we, what we see also, what I see is that uh, the traditional Catholics uh, see more and more why secularism is important. This is what I also try to, to explain to them. Uh, First of all, a secularism is not atheism, mm. and secularism is really the, the guarantee for your uh, re religious views. They can be also opposite to the Catholic catechism. So you have the right to believe in your God however you want, and for example, not to, to take all the dogmas from your church. You have this right. You have the right. The state gives you the right to go to an abortion, to go to uh, artificial insemination, uh, to uh, divorce. So these are secular, <laughs> yeah. secular principles. This is what, uh, why secularism is very important. And that's what they understand. And they understand also something else, that the conservatives, uh, they uh, first, like in this poem from Martin Niemöller, first they came uh, and take the, 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 the communists, and so I was not a communist, and so on. This is also, first they, they took the, the LGBT, uh, then they took, uh, then they, at the end they will go uh, for, for the abortion. So that's how people understand, okay, I'm, I'm a religious person, uh, but I am not homophobic, I am not uh, uh, 
anti-feminist and so on. And this is this is where we can we as humanists have uh, how to say people where we can count on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. build up bridges. Yeah, yeah that that's why uh, that's why I I uh, I don't see uh, okay we can of course we can mock religion and so mm -hmm. on, but it's not the the the, the, the aim is to 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 say to the people, we are not the threat. Yeah. We are not the threat. It's your church yes. <laughs> who is the threat. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, same question to you. Well, there's actually a lot yes. I can yeah. say, but I'll say You're it the winner. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. When my mother and I started the Freedom from Religion Foundation, this is going to age me, 1976, when I was a college student, there were three of us, my mother, a friend, and myself. Today we have over 40,000 dues-paying members wow, in the Freedom from Religion Foundation. Over 35 staff, a third of whom are attorneys, and every year they end over 150 violations of separation of state and church by writing legal complaint letters alone. Amazing. Then we have lawsuits. And then I just wanted to say that the American public is pro-choice, it is pro-abortion rights, it is um, the majority support uh, marriage equality, gay, gay marriage. The, it's the extremists who are the minority in this case, and that is good news. It's just bad news that they are so wealthy and so organized and have taken over our courts thanks to Trump. But yeah. there is a lot of good news there. That, that, is, that is fantastic news, absolutely. Thank you so much. A third of the population today yeah. of the citizens are religiously unaffiliated. Now, a majority don't call themselves atheists or agnostics, but we call them the nuns, N-O-N-E-S. And up to almost half of Gen Z are religiously unaffiliated. So yep. that is a huge sea change. Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Speaking of free speech, what do you think is the scariest thing to say in your part of the world right now? Uh, what do you think is the what, what, what do you fear to say the most? Let's say in, in your in your region, for example, in Algeria or Nigeria, uh, what is the scariest thing? What is the biggest hurdle you would say? I'm now living in France, and I can tell you for sure that secularism and separation is being eroded, and France is being pushed in a very fiercely fierce way to adopt equal tolerance by the state instead of separation. So I think we are really losing ground in a very serious way. I believe that this is accepted so widely because it affects primarily women when we have specific laws for specific communities. For instance, Muslim fundamentalists are not requesting a change in criminal law. They request changes in personal law, which is what affects women most. And human rights organizations defend the rights of a community mm -hmm. rather than the rights of women, which are being totally eroded. So, so the biggest problem is individual versus the community, the family. And that, the, I think this all comes back to subverting the individual rights. And once, you, once that's gone, then everything else can follow pretty much. So I want to take some time for some questions. So very quickly, what's the biggest challenge for free speech in your area, please? Um, well, I think uh, in Nigeria, you can't even use the word, w even women, they are scared of that word. Mm -hmm. um, gender equality and free speech. Is it seen as like a Western... Yeah, they see it as a Western right. ideology, and they also see it as if you're a puppet of the West, being paid by the West to desecrate the holy sacrament of whatever it is that is happening down there. So, uh, yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Perfect. It's interesting. Scariest thing to say? Uh, well, after the Charlie Hebdo uh, massacre, Nobody showed a picture of Mohammed uh, after the Batley incident. No one showed an image of what the teacher used as a teaching resource. There's been various other incidences involving uh, uh, depictions of, of Mohammed. You know, yeah. There's been a complete no blackout, so that's clearly a no-go zone. I also think the gender identity debate has been pretty toxic for free expression in the UK as well, uh, and everywhere else probably. We've yeah. seen so many people shut down, and the idea of you know, having sensible, rational debate has just gone out the window yep. and people have been closed down and, and, and cancelled. Um, so I think that's been pretty toxic as well recently, yeah. but I think maybe we're coming over the hill of that a little bit, I, I think. But still, it's, it's the profit of having, that's yeah. the ultimate taboo in the UK still, I would say. Absolutely. 
Okay, I wanted to ask, may, may you show the picture now? Yes, okay. Please, I will take my minute for okay. to introduce. Okay. Yes, this is, uh, I am introducing you to the Brave Sisters. Uh, this is a women's abortion network. I will be very fast. So, in Croatia, abortion is legal, but uh, the obstacles, there are many obstacles. Uh, the biggest obstacle is that 60%, maybe even 70% of the gynecologists in the 30 public hospitals are not performing abortion grounding on religious because of religious reasons. They are taking this conscience of objection to say they don't want to perform it. Uh, this is the problem. The stigmatization of abortion is a problem. So, feminist activism comes all, always from anger. I, I was angry at this. Why, what happened to women? That women, when they call the uh, hospital, they will say to you, oh no, we don't do it here. Or uh, women who go to, to, to make an abortion, they, they try to pursue them. No, don't do it. Uh, why? Or they show them the monitor, they show them the, they let them hear the, the, the heartbeat. And I was so angry and I uh, founded this uh, bo women's abortion network. We have our uh, site here, Habra means brave, brave sisters, and in these three years we we supported over 700 women. We supported them that they get the abortion. We supported them uh, uh, with information where they can go, how they can go, yeah. where everything. And what I wanted to show only these three pictures in the middle. You see, this uh, oh, picture is the so-called March of Life. This picture are uh, prayers in front of hospitals, and the newest one, what we have in the last two years, are these so-called kneelers, men who kneel in the uh, in the main square of Zagreb and all other squares uh, in 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 Croatia, uh, the first Saturday in the month, and they are praying, uh, praying for for chastity for women, uh, uh, yes, we want the Iran <laughs> regime, uh, of course, against abortion and so on. And you see us here on the uh, right, uh, uh, yes, this is me in front of, uh, of Kneeler saying, go out from my uterus. Uh, these are my brave sisters who are telling, and this is the most important thing, feminist solidarity. Every woman who, who, uh, who contacts us, we don't judge, we don't ask, we help her, we understand her, we know why she, it's enough stigmatization, we are here to help her, and that's why a woman to woman, how the homo hominis lupus, we say women to woman is a brave sister. Thanks Thank so you. Much. Trump seems like the scariest. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, what's the, the thing that's like, you don't want to go there? What? Well, I, I would say that this isn't quite the right answer, but book bans are going after the um, anything to do with gay, LGBTQ, uh, yes, um, yes. anything to do with black history, the history of how our country treated black people, slavery, what it's like to be a black person, these are being censored. Um, and of course, anything that is... Um, harsh on religion, The Handmaid's Tale, mm -hmm. the old classics, um, mm -hmm. Are You There, God, It's Me, Margaret, which is actually a book for children on menstruation, and it's actually atheist characters. So those are the things that are getting mm -hmm. banned. Interesting, interesting. And it's a big deal. No, absolutely. Yeah, you can keep that, keep that. Thank you so much. Quick round of applause before we get to questions. Woo! Woo! Uh, let's take two questions. And then we'll, yeah? Oh, you got a question? Do you get priority or should we... No, 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 no. no, no, no. <laughs> I've got the microphone. I'm first. Yeah, the microphone. Okay. <laughs> Can I have two questions if you don't mind? Uh, one, please. One, one, one okay. People. So, okay. I'm going to ask Stefan. I do remember last uh, December in Paris, I talked to Megan Manson, uh, your colleague probably, and she said the same, almost the same thing that you said, like, um, I believe like national uh, secular society doesn't uh, recognize UK as a secular country. 
I want to know your reason. Why is that? And my second part of the question would be, how is the different? I mean, how is it going to affect the life of the citizens comparing to, for example, a country like France, where they, they, there's license to there? Is there any big difference uh, okay. based sure. on, like, you know, yeah, citizens' um, experience of living Thank in you. those uh, countries? Thank you. Do we have another question, please? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one of the things uh, we have talked about is how the discussion is shut down by calling racism, calling blasphemy, Islamophobia. But one of the new things we've noticed now in Norway, uh, in a recent uh, case, that one of the previous ministers, uh, when he wrote an article in a book about criticizing fundamental Islam and warning about certain development, he was attempted to be shut down by research. Very really sorry, what's the yes, question? The question. Uh, what do you think about using research uh, about Islam and how Muslim youth are developing and so on to shut down the conversation or to take us off the platform? Yeah. Because that has been happening. Thank you. Uh, just this one here, please. And then we'll go for quick answers here. Okay, great. Uh, we saw in the movie just now that um, secular uh, the SSA is not a given. Uh, and we are, I live in a Western country and I'm starting to see changes in society yep. that moved are moving us towards that kind of setup. So what can we learn from the people who have been in these countries and watched them devolve? What can we learn and what can we do to make yep. sure it doesn't happen in okay. our own countries? Thank you so much. Uh, okay, go on. To give you a chance to clarify, Marie, you're not multi-faithism. You're defending a concept of laicite. It was very far from multi-faithism and she spent, yep. I don't know, 40 or 50 years Defending Thank that. So thanks so much. Okay, questions. Should I just quickly address the one? So um, yeah, I said the UK is not a secular state. I think we are a secular country in terms of mindset, but we're not a secular state. Why do I say that? I say that because you can't be the head of state in the UK unless you're the king, because we have a monarchy that is also the defender of the faith. Uh, we have an established church uh, by law, making us a Christian country technically. Uh, we have 26 Anglican bishops that sit as of right in our upper chamber, the upper legislature, uh, the House of Lords. Uh, we have um, state-funded faith schools, uh, not just Christian schools, we have state-funded Hindu, Muslim, Sikh, Jewish schools. Uh, in all schools we have a law that requires a daily act of Christian worship. Um, you know, we have prayers, uh, begin all of our parliamentary sessions in both chambers. Uh, I could go on, you know, th yeah. there's lots of reasons why the UK is not yet a secular state. Uh, Huge majorities of the population don't support those positions, um, so our institutions really need to catch up with the people. There's been a massive decline in Christianity over the last hundred years. It's just an absolute freefall. Uh, we're now a nation of, um, it's almost majority non really it depends on which poll you look at, but there are certainly some, polling, yeah. some polls that suggest we are now a majority non-religious nation. So. Yeah, we're, we're, we're a secular nation in some ways, but we're, we're still not a secular state. Okay, um, who wanted to answer any, any of those questions? Yeah, yeah. You want to take that one? Yeah, please. Well, uh, speak out. Um, don't put up with anything. Um, I mean, I think that uh, protesting, organizing, insisting that we are not deferential to religion, um, insisting on critical thinking, and that we cannot be forced to um, bow our heads to a religion we have no evidence for, I mean, just being, doing what <coughs> celebrating dissent is all about, but uh, continuing and not being cowed, um, not being feeling like you have to be too polite. Uh, I think it's okay to see what the other side does. I mean, the, <laughs> the neoconservatives, I say. Uh, they are very active. I, sometimes I have a really a problem that I see that in in the group <laughs> where I am that always the same 50 people are active going on the street and so on. So I think we should be more active. We should more uh, uh, making networking to get a more strategic planning, not always to answer to some, uh, to be a rea uh, reaction, but to be an action. This is a problem. And this means, yes, I'm, I have to say it, we liberals or lefts are a little bit lazy, and we are always fa Facebook warriors, but if you have to go to the street, if you have to, to make uh, 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 yeah. uh, 
So this is what I, I would say, be more active. Perfect, thank you. I think maybe two, three more questions, because we've got four and a half minutes left. You have a question? Can I? You may, you may. I think it, it follows from what Nada just mentioned. Um, do we not need, bearing on what we've just heard, in terms of assault, uh, severe assault by the right-wing religious nationalist group of various kinds, uh, on the fundamental rights, and actually they're making progress when you compare it for 20, 30 years ago, they are making progress, they've, they've come forward. Do we not need a new form of organisation? Do we not need new form of networking? Do we not think that the current setup that we have, that we served us yeah. quite well defending, it may be that we need to change that. The reason I say this, and I need to give context, when the recent riots, race riots have started in, in, in London, for the first couple of days people were shocked. And I thought, oh, this is, this is getting out of hand. Well, very quickly, old networks that were well, 30, 40 years ago, and new networks from Jewish community, from secular Muslim, from anti-fascist, everybody got together, and suddenly there were mass demonstrations in England. That was the reason that they shut off the fascist. Mm -hmm. And suddenly the turn and the mood changed in England. Everybody called it Farage riot, right? But even the most right-wing newspaper started attacking the, you know, the rioters on the street. That new network suddenly appeared on the streets. You know, all the networks or from Jewish uh, Holocaust survivors came in, anti-fascists yeah. came in, that they were not talking to each other a while ago, but suddenly they came together. Do we not need to rebuild those networks and new type of organizations okay. to, to challenge this? That's the question. It's a great question. Um, anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm still back to the first one. Well, for me, I feel like, yeah, beauty networks is important, but there are specific innovative ideas that I think coming up with those innovative ideas um, could really help you achieve sustainability in terms of your activities. Um, in Northern Nigeria, it's very difficult for you to talk to a woman without wearing hijab, which is why during the time, even though I was already an, I was an ex-Muslim, I've pronounced that I was an ex-Muslim, whenever I still go to the field to do some activities, I put on the hijab. But it's not because I am comfortable with it, it's because the person I need to support um, you know, needs me to wear it so she could listen to me to, 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 to provide the assistance I want to for her. And I'm not saying you should use that specific concept. You could also use another concept. Another thing that worked was the reverse psychology where um, we, we take mothers of, of young girls who have been who are married of young to hospitals, different hospitals to show them, you know, the uh, outcome of, of child marriage and um, what could happen as a result of your child giving birth, you know, at a certain age and you know the different medical challenges. So by the time they see they, they become scared and then you go, okay, we don't want this for our daughter. And then we also take them to other places where young girls are getting gifts and awards. You know, from, so this are the kind, for us, it's not really about the network, you know, for me, uh, it's, it's the innovative ideas in the activities or in the way we send out our messages. Yeah. This is what has worked so far for me. Thank you. Awesome. Any uh, question? Uh, yeah, please. Yeah. I, um, I, we, can't, we can't talk so idealistic, you know, so come together and so on. Because the problem, I, th I see the problem is that uh, all organizations, women's organization, or lefts, or, or LGBTs, they are so in their projectization stuff. They are focusing on their projects to live, to, 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 to be, I mean, mean that, and that's the problem. I mean, we, we, we have no money. We do everything on, and it is very exhausting. So what you suggest, or what would be great, really needs, needs uh, people who, who have uh, uh, money. money and who can pay for this work. This is, this, so don't, don't it idolize, don't, we, we can do it for one year or so, but if you want to do it strategically like these people are doing, we need funds, we need, we de and then, there is an organization, but so, as I said to you, always the, the same 10, 20 or 50 people are going to the streets. That's, that's, that's the reality. Awesome, thank you everyone. I think time is up now. No, okay, so time is up, thank you so much for that question. No, thank you for all your questions, thank you everyone.